Um, then two more, this is 1845 on the left, um, essentially uh, a um, uh, notes on his tour, his first tour alone, without his parents, that is, to Italy in 1845, looking at Renaissance art. Uh, and he starts to correlate, uh, in this case, uh, drawings detailed with descriptions of paintings. And at the top left there, um, there's actually a little note, and he starts even using letters. He can be quite meticulous and thorough, um, Ruskin, when he wanted to be. That's Raphael's Madonna della Colonna um, in the Doria Pamphili gal Gallery, where he says, two queer mountains in the distance, close to the head as at A, um, seem injurious to the picture. Very typical kind of detail um, for Ruskin. On the 1847 on the left, 1846, 47 diary, there's some wonderful image of, of, of old and new. I'm sorry, it's upside inverted. Um, the sail, the age of sail, Turner's uh, Britain, if you like, was probably drawn in, um, in Dunbar in Scotland. Turner's Britain giving way to the sort of 19th century steamboats and, um, and whistles that Ruskin so loathed. Um, and we also see that there's a self-annotation as he returns to the notebooks um, in later life. Um, this little section here actually refers to his stay in 1847 with a friend up in Scotland, a place called Crossmount. Um, and at the top, um, he's written, going back many years later, probably in the 1880s, when he looked through his diaries as a means of revision and pre preparation for his great Auto unfinished autobiography, Praeterita, he writes, Crossmount, 1847, five lines, exclamation mark, everything missed till December. So again, just seeing that there uh, on the screen is not quite the same as, as, as seeing, again, a difference of ink and feeling that this is something that has been worked and, and reworked. Um, there are so many other things. Oh, this is something. <laughs> I'll take my word for it. The, uh, along the edge of the screen here is actually the drawing of a nettle where... Um, He's worked out the botanical proportions. Um, he didn't trust Linnaeus. He thought, as Ruskin always did, that you could, you could do anything better by your own empirical observation. So, rather like Mr. Casubon, um, he's, he's, he starts doing things all over again according to his own principles, usually contradicting himself, of course. Um, but in this case, he's actually measured a nettle, and he's used the sheet of the paper and the size of the paper to determine the way in which he does that. So these are um, they're, they're sort of laboratory notes, as well as just diaries and the outpourings um, of minds. And then, of course, you have, as you usually do, as a nice um, stub, sorry there, um, as you usually do in diary notebooks, you get not just journal material, but also um, jottings, addresses. This one is from 1857, rather nicely. It's got G.P. Boyce, um, the pre-Raphaelite um, painter. It's got Thomas Fairburn, the instigator of the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition of 1857, to which um, Ruskin was persuaded um, reluctantly to lend some of his turners. Um, and we even have the name of Mr. James Smith uh, of Edinburgh, who sends me a letter to moderator of the General Assembly. Um, significant to Ruskin, as he always thought of himself as a Scot. Um, this is a, a, an interesting case where the diary has actually proved of extremely invaluable, um, uh, a valuable resource in terms of identification of something. This is the 1854, one of the 1854 diaries, where he's travelling in um, Switzerland in the valley of um, Sion at Ardon, um, and this notebook goes with this drawing. What we have, as I said, in, in the Raskin Library is essentially, we call it the White House Collection, assembled by John Howard Whitehouse um, after Ruskin's death and after the dispersal of his collections. I think some people assume that what you see at Brantwood is, is, has always been there, and this isn't the case. There was a complete dispersal, yes, um, um, from Brantwood in, um, in, in 1930, after 1931. So all these things have been brought back together again, and it's only through the perspicacity of, of, of White House who assembled all this material, I think, who realized that it, it, it did all fit together. And so you can tell from this notebook, this notebook actually refers to this drawing, again, with little letters. And, and from those two things, um, it's actually been possible to identify this daguerreotype, which is also in the collection, one of the 125 we have at Lancaster, as the same subject. It looks a little different because a drawing is a drawing and it's not a photograph, which is why you have to be very careful relying on any topographical drawing. Um, but it is the same place, um, believe me, and that can now be proven. Of course, that it's bound, it's inevitable that the things um, go together. And of course, there are plenty of other extraneous materials in these wonderful diary notebooks. There are chess puzzles. In fact, there's a whole chess 
notebook. Um, <laughs> this is in, this is one that got away, as it were. This is, again, it's in the Pierpont um, Morgan Library. Ruskin was a great chess player. He was an honorary vice president of the British Chess Federation. He was an honorary vice president of anything, everything. But, um, <laughs> great social chess player. He played correspondence chess. He played chess with his dentist. He even played the, the automaton, the great Turk at the Crystal Palace, which eventually turned out to be, to be a fake. Um, there are um, diagrams. He didn't know. That. Well, he did, actually. He, he thought he, he, thought he realised it was. There are lecture notes, diagrams, lists, maps, itineraries, financial accounts, uh, and for Helen, even a recipe for brown bread. Uh, so, so there really is everything. And then finally, um, uh, we get the intimates, the, the, the real intimacies in, in these diaries when you, you feel almost, um, almost prurient and <laughs> looking at them and, 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 and intrusive. Um, this is one extraordinary example of 1856. He's in Geneva, um, and whatever um, spurred him to do this, you can just about read that. He says on the left, he's 37 at this time, he began a countdown of days to his 70th birthday. It says, calculation of number of days which, under perfect term of human life, I might have to live. <laughs> um, 11,795, 11,794, and so on. And it, it's, I mean, but it does help to, to try and understand that extraordinary mind, which of course failed him in the end, just from, from being Ruskin. Um, and the irony is that although he, he lived to be 80, um, his mind actually collapsed when he was 70. So he was effectively dead from the age of 70 after a, a massive kind of, 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 of mental stroke, which is was terribly poignant. There's also another countdown of days in a later diary um, between the time that Rose Latouche more or less accepted his, um, uh, his, his proposal of marriage and, until her 21st birthday. Um, and that, of course, came to nothing, um, sadly, either. Uh, and then finally, of course, we have, this is the very last diary um, of 1888, um, just before his, his final collapse. He's in Venice, he just gets to Venice, and there he has a breakdown, Joan Seven is called, and she has to come, effectively bring him back. And you get this, um, the Venetians among the kindest people in the world, and then also here, but I don't know what is going to become of me. It's so, um, it's so incredibly, um, so incredibly, um, poignant. Um, but the wonder is that these amazing uh, manuscripts survive at all, not entirely intact, um, as every page which might have mentioned Effie Gray, his, 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 his wife, for instance, have been removed. There are an awful lot of, of, of those stubs, but enough to shed much light on more on the life than has ever been achieved through the copious biographical um, writings um, on Ruskin. Um, so I hope this has, has answered um, Jeff's brief in, um, in that way. Oh, I just put that in on the right to, um, as contrast because that's a page from the um, 1859 um, edition of Joan Evans. Well, you see that, and you look at it, and you, you don't really think much of it. it just, it's just not the same as seeing the, um, seeing the original. But we do now have a challenge, although we have this in, 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 in um, digital microfilm form. Um, we are now planning with Duke University and David Sorensen through what is called the Victorian Life and Letters Consortium, um, a plan... Um, for a bid to the National Endowment for Humanities for a, um, a, a digitized version of the diary notebooks that would actually rise to the challenge of what you do, not just with, with the text, but also with that extraordinary wealth of material um, of the greatest um, British polymath there has ever been. Thank you. <laughs>